Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene Interviews, where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. I'm John Lynn, the founder of HealthCareScene.com, a network of leading healthcare IT resources. We've done over 10,000 blog posts over 10 years, and now we're doing lots of videos. I realize this is our 51st video that we've done, a video interview at Healthcare Scene, so I guess we've become a video production house as well. So. Uh, that's exciting, and uh, I'm excited today to be talking about healthcare communication with a whole group of experts. Uh, as many of you know, we usually use the Blab platform, which just shut down. We're in a little bit of a morning right now, trying to figure out what to do because we it really liked the uh, Blab platform and its ability to see everyone. Hopefully, uh, we've moved to Google Hangouts, and hopefully, uh, this uh, the Hangouts will evolve into what Blab had and some of the other features. But for now, uh, we'll use it, and uh, it has some great features as well. Uh, anyways, without further ado, if you have any questions uh, during the chat or after, uh, you know, feel free to put them in the chat area on the right side of the YouTube. Uh, uh, page, landing page for the video, and we'll do our best to incorporate those questions as we see them and as they fit into the conversation. So uh, thanks for watching live, or if you're watching the recorded version, thanks. Uh, I think that's all the logistics. Now let's uh, let's introduce each of our guests. We have a whole panel here, uh, you know, with big props to our first guest for uh, really encouraging this to happen and uh, putting together this group of. Uh, Let's call ourselves misfits, so that we uh, I think I think we all like the misfit terminology, right? Uh, first up, we have uh, Mandy Bishop. She's the chief evangelist and co-founder of Aloha Health. Welcome, Mandy. Hey, John. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm really grateful to be included. I think that healthcare communications has the opportunity to truly revolutionize the industry, and we talk about disruptive innovation. And I think that the communication space is ripe for disruption. So I can't wait to hear what our guests have to say. Excellent. And in your background, you were previously at Dell, but uh, now you're out on your own, right? Yes, indeed. So I, um, up until recently, I ran Dell's Global Healthcare Analytics Consulting Division, and um, I have just recently founded a new venture, Aloha Health, which intends to make the life context of health actionable. So we are still kind of in super secret, super secret startup mode, but as more details become available, you will definitely be one of the first people to know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll be doing a blab about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Excellent. Welcome, Mandy. All right, next up we have Jessica Johnson, Director of Operations of Health Transformation at Dartmouth Hitchcock Population Health Management. Is that a mouthful? Welcome, Jessica. It is. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, happy to be here with this um, panel of colleagues and um, friends uh, to ha talk about this important topic. Excellent. And what's your background, Jessica? Um, my background is actually started outside of healthcare, which I think is actually a plus. Um, it's in uh, business development. I did some government contracting work for a long time in D.C., and then I came back to the um, New England region to um, start my work in healthcare policy at TDI and then moved across the street into healthcare quality specific to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and then um, moved into the innovation space thereafter. So it's been nice. great. And, and now you're in the population health section of dartmouth Hitchcock, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Our health uh, transformation group sits within population health here at dartmouth Hitchcock. Excellent. Welcome. Glad to have you here. And, you know, Jessica was the other driving force. We got the power women driving us men. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not unusual. <laughs> and maybe more of that in health IT. <laughs> more women in health IT. So th thanks, Jessica. Uh, next up, we have Ethan uh, Bechtel, CEO of OMD. Welcome, Ethan. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great. And uh, tell us about your background and where you're at as uh, CEO. What does OMD do? Sure. So uh, I've been in healthcare since I can remember. I actually grew up in a health IT um, company that my mother started back when uh, I was vacuuming floors and, and cleaning the kitchen uh, in the old office. So um, I've been implementing electronic medical records for uh, the better part of my life um, for the past 12 years and, and really just uh, more recently have been focused on how to really uh, simplify communication in healthcare to improve the patient experience. So um, that's what OMD is all about, is just simplifying that experience and bringing a more consumer-centric uh, approach to communication in healthcare. Excellent. And I think you win the uh, award for uh, best uh, healthcare IT company name, OMD. 
I can only... <laughs> oh, my God. I can never hear that enough. It's the best thing. Thank you. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I can I only imagine the meetings and the number of time iterations you... Uh, you guys do behind closed doors, but <laughs> I, uh, I listen. That was a, it was uh, it had more to do with domain name than anything else, but uh, it all came together. It was great. Thank you. Excellent. All right, and our final guest, uh, last but not least, uh, probably first, probably deserves right, uh, is uh, Nathan Larson, Chief Experience Officer at Imagine Care. Welcome, Nate. Great to be here. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to uh, participate. Excellent. And tell us about your background and about Imagine Care. Sure. Uh, like some of the other folks, I came from outside healthcare. Uh, my background's entrepreneurial startups and actually the health, um, the hospitality industry, as well as working in uh, promotional marketing, experiential marketing. Uh, joined uh, an innovation group at Dartmouth Hitchcock actually two years ago before we spun Imagine Care out as an independent company. And I've really been focused on bringing kind of those best of practices we use in other industries so well around uh, consumer communication into customer-driven tools in healthcare, and that's what Imagine Care does. Excellent. Well, uh, th like I said, it's a powerful group, so uh, you know certainly let's let's make keep it an open discussion, and uh, everyone can contribute. Uh, but maybe uh, Jessica, you want to start off, kind of tell us what's the state of healthcare communication today and, and patient engagement. What, what do you see happening today, and then we can go from there. So I feel like um, those are seen as two separate entities and probably should be seen as one. I think that's really first the, the issue that I see. Um, a lot of this, the niche solutions go after one or the other of those, um, the healthcare communication part and patient engagement, but patient engagement really is all about communication. and. Um, other industries do this really well. They look at the consumer and the competitor um, perspective and figure out from the outside in what that's best going to look like. And I think um, what's really going to drive that is if we have the aligned regulatory pieces and the other things that don't maybe aren't ex existing elsewhere in other industries uh, as such big drivers as they do in healthcare um, to really empower the consumer to be able to communicate and be a participant um, in the conversation um, first and foremost. Excellent. Anything you'd add, uh, Mandy? Yes, it's funny. So, and, and I, in, in context of this conversation, I want to make sure everybody who's watching us and everybody who has an opportunity to follow this afterwards knows that I'm live tweeting. So I am multitasking during the conversation because I want to make sure that that we are uh, that we are getting an audience um, as we are doing this. So just. FYI, multitasking, so occasionally I might have to repeat the question, but yes, I think that what Jess said about the consolidation and the misunderstanding of, of engagement and communication being two completely separate um, concepts is, is, a, is an unfortunate byproduct of a lot of the regulatory mandate we're following in the industry today, and I think the more that we are able to break out of that box and break out of the thinking about the right way to approach healthcare and how to disrupt healthcare, part of that disruption is breaking out of that regulatory mandate box thinking. So, so Jess, yes, I 100% I agree with you. That's interesting, and I think it's also interesting that Imagine Care rolled out of the population health efforts mm -hmm. uh, because I think many people looked at population health not as healthcare communication necessarily because they often just had people you know, hitting the phones, uh, you know, and I don't even know if they put, you know, even though it's communication, I don't know if they put that into that box, right? Um, so I think it's interesting that it came from the population health side because as I've seen it evolve, I think communication has been one of the backbones of population health and really kind of secure electronic communication. Any thoughts you'd add, Nate? Yeah, I think kind of two points struck me in just the comments I just heard. The first thing is that, uh, you know, Customers expect the same things from healthcare as far as service and communication as every other industry. And there's, uh, you can pick a study or pick pick your favorite consulting group and look at their study, um, and you'll find that customers have the same expectations we do in in any other industry of healthcare. Um, so the the fact that we've somehow set the two apart and said that healthcare can have different standards uh, is is kind of a false read of the actual consumer desire the customer want. And I think the second thing is that your to your last point there is that um, making these communication tools driven by actual customers first as opposed to clinician or optimizing clinician workflow first I think is a really important nuance 
that if you uh, create products and communication tools in healthcare that are actually driven by what the customer needs and meeting the customer where they are, uh, as opposed to trying to make care coordinators and doctors and the system more efficient, you end up with different product, different tone and a different product. And, and I see that as kind of an interesting internal struggle going on in healthcare right now. Of some of these products seem very much driven by clinician and, and current brick and mortar um, workflow organization, and others seem very much driven by consumer consumer desire and need. And I think there's an interesting um, nuance there. Hmm. It's interesting. We might have to dive into what is a clinician-driven workflow versus a patient-driven workflow. But, but before we get there, I, you know, I guess you, you raised the question with your first point, you know, why is healthcare lagging so far behind, right? I mean, the consumers want the same sort of interactions with their healthcare as they do every other consumer industry. So why is it that healthcare can't keep pace or I mean is healthcare so different than these other industries that it deserves to take longer anyone want to take a swing at that I, there's a lot of answers to that one um, <laughs> you know I, I think it would be great to hear everybody's perspective on it I think uh, there obviously is the big picture idea of is there any kind of economic trigger to make them be different and I think that's uh, been kind of the last thing to hit the ground here which is that uh, as competition is increased for in healthcare space, you know whether it's I can now go to a, a pharmacy for my primary care, or I can go to a Walmart for uh, primary care, I can go to all these different outlets, and, and the competitiveness of the market I think has driven some of it. But without that, um, I do think you know in any industry, a lot of times innovation stymies if there's not an economic interest on on the one end. So that's that might be the economic driven answer to it, which um, certainly plays into it. Yeah, I think piggybacking off of Nate, the on the economic side, you know, the the B two B model that um, healthcare traditionally is, with the small small C off to the side, is, is the C is starting to rise and and get more of a voice. I feel like, and the um, the economic side is that the 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 customer of a lot of these healthcare solutions is the provider or is the payer. And um, the, the the consumer or the end user, it it that doesn't exist in other industries. And I think the answer to the question of does healthcare deserve to take longer to get there, I think the ecosystem impressions that we're starting to see are are starting to say no to that to that question, and say you know with the millennial generation coming up and expecting. Um, the expectation of that generation are a lot different than traditional, uh, than other generations. And I think that um, we're going to start to see that. And you also see things on the regulatory side, like around the chronic care management billing codes and incenting pushing care out into the home and communities as a, as a cost-saving measure. But also that will drive some of the um, more consumer things to be able to engage patients in between visits and understand what's going on with them in between visits. So I think, I think, I think there, there's going to be a rise in these uh, solutions and a, um, a departure from uh, the traditional means of saying that healthcare can take its time. And some interesting points about, uh, Mandy, I'll come right to you, but yeah. it, you know, it, it's interesting, you're right, the C has been small, if you're talking about the consumer, right, like in right. healthcare, it seems to me, is it because it, they just didn't need it to be big, I mean, you know, they were all feeding from the fat calf, so they didn't need necessarily to focus on the consumer, uh, it, you know, Mandy, go ahead and add uh, to it as well. Well, and it's funny because it Jeff just hit on something that, that has been um, a theme of many of the conferences that I've attended this year, which is the, what is the rise of the millennials? Um, what is that going to do to all of our healthcare systems and all of the employment around healthcare? So I think that communications and the changing expectations of the millennials um, and how that's going to impact communications is not just going to affect healthcare consumers, but it's going to uh, affect the expectations of the physicians and of you know, any of the clinicians, of, of the nurses, of the, of the CNAs. Like it's, it's going to impact the entire healthcare workforce as well as the consumers of healthcare uh, over time. So I, I think that, that those expectations can only accelerate the disruption in healthcare communications and provide ripe opportunity for um, 
you know, for organizations like OMD to come and, and provide solutions to a more millennial acceptable level of communications and care. There's kind of one, one point not to kind of throw us off script though is that um, I found that there isn't really, it's not restricted to millennials. Um, we have a wide demographic of folks on Imagine Care which uses secure texting and other tools, similar tools, um, uh, and we see a huge utilization in our chronic disease population of 65 and over of those tools. Actually three times more uh, folks uh, prefer texting over our phone interactions even in that demographic. So I, do, I don't want to kind of uh, let us pigeonhole this into a millennial driven solution either. I think we see wide adoption across all demographics of better consumer service now in the current state, um, not, not tomorrow. In that spirit I'd like to amend it to just saying changing expectations of the population in general which I think will continue to push upward in that way. <laughs> right. Sure, but I think it's fair to say millennials have been pushing it harder, right? I mean, I think they have a stronger voice that says, you better give this to me or I'm going somewhere else, whereas some of the more senior population uses it but doesn't necessarily drive the adoption, right. which I think is a fair point. They'll just make your patient satisfaction scores go down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They'll just complain on the survey after. Right. The I want exactly. to tell you up front, this is my expectation. Right. Interesting. And, you know, it's funny, I, uh, I saw a tweet which actually I highlighted on smartphonehc.com, uh, which was a, a, a guy from Ireland, I just forgot his name, uh, 3G Doctor. Uh, he said that uh, he just saw a 95-year-old tapping away at his iPhone with a plethora of apps, and he linked to this article from, I think, 2010, which said, my grandma will never use a health app on their iPhone. It was, uh, you know, kind of an interesting juxtaposition as far as adoption. Um, but kind of coming back to this, why isn't it being adopted? Uh, you know, I th I'm glad Ethan was able to get back on. Uh, but it, you know, it's so interesting that text message is simple, and everyone started to adopt it. But healthcare, so right. you know, why right. hasn't healthcare adopted text messaging? It's so simple. We all see how u useful it is. It's such a easy way to you know communicate and collaborate. What's uh, holding it back, Ethan? Um, so the way I've always looked at this has been. Um, you can look at the consumer tech industry and you can learn a lot about how uh, the evolution in education tech is going to happen, in uh, finance tech, you can look at, at healthcare in the same way. So when you start looking at what works in the consumer space, um, all you really have to do is say, you know, I, I want to be, you know, this, you know, the Instagram of healthcare is going to look like this and we know people are going to use it because it works in the consumer world and they can understand the concepts. Um, I feel like healthcare, like it's always kind of been, lags a little bit behind in understanding that consumers need to drive this technology adoption, um, that they can't force it top down. And that's kind of the way we've always felt about it is that if, uh, if we come up with a simple enough solution that we know people will use because they already understand the technology, that eventually they can, uh, especially nowadays, can force uh, healthcare to make uh, a little bit of progress in adopting the same types of technologies that are a little bit more consumer centric. So what, I, to answer your question, why hasn't healthcare adopted it, I guess? Uh, just, it's, I, you, you know the answer as well as I do. I think it's just there's a million other priorities, and, uh, and they're focused on uh, ROI, and they're focused on a lot of other things that uh, take priority. And so you know, texting, uh, I think, is happening. Doctors are texting each other. They're texting each other. They're doing it. Uh, Unsecure way, Secure and so health is starting to realize that that's kind of an issue. And and following up on Ethan's point, I think that it's it is happening. It's not. It might have taken a long time coming, but it definitely is happening. And it's um it's actually becoming an irritant in some customer satisfaction surveys in healthcare if it's not there. So I think that's the sea change. You know that if a customer satisfaction, as Jess alluded to, starts to fall because these these things that now are assumed to be just standard aren't provided in services that you're you're paying for, then then it starts to be another driver as well. Yep. I yeah. think I think I think it, 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 they, they if, if systems have invested, have invested in, um, in, uh, in a in a, in a solution already, then they're investing in yesterday if they have to keep that going. So there's limited um, new capital or new um, dollars that they can expend for uh, a, moving off of an old model into a new one is often more painful than 
being able to skip a generation. And that might be something that Ethan can talk to as well. Is that I mean, the investment, Ethan, as you know from from the systems that healthcare has, has you know put investments into, a lot of times that's the hindrance to them moving to anything else because they've invested a hundred million, eighty million, two hundred million dollars in. In a in an EHR module, um, and and that's they're going to make that work no matter what. So I think where OMD's been really interesting is in approaching that that problem too. Well, yeah, I mean the impetus to OMD was looking at patient portal. Um, obviously, that was a regulatory requirement. That's what drove patient portal to be purchased and implemented in all of these health systems. Um, but the the problem I always had with patient portal, while I understand the intent behind it, is uh, is pure. Um, if nobody's using it, or a very low percentage of the patients are using it or using it well, then the value really isn't there. And so um, you're right. How do you, you know? And, and I think that brings us to another question. I'm sure we're going to talk about later, which is how do you balance all of the different types of communication uh, or types of tools that can be used in a healthcare, in a healthcare system, healthcare system because there's so much overlap. Yep. That is, that is definitely a challenge. Definitely a challenge. Were you trying to chime yeah. in? <laughs> well, I, well I, I, I was, and, and so little, I have a thought that, that is a little outside of, the, of this, the context of this, but my phone, as we're sitting here having this conversation, my phone is, is scrolling through, and, I, and I've, I, I've got, I must, must have 10 or 15 text messages just since we started this conversation. And so I think about you know, one of the barriers to adoption being the integration of workflow, a texting workflow into um, a clinician's world, right? And so what, what would it mean to be able to open the doors to that level of instant communication? And then what does that mean from a consumer expectation standpoint? Is there is there an expectation that there will be an immediate response and that kind of thing. So beyond the, the HIPAA smoke screen and beyond the investment in new technology that everyone's making in EHR and the modifications to workflow that, that are incumbent upon the EHR adoption push, I think about just the, the act of being a clinician receiving text messages from your patients and how to make sure that, that culturally and, and um, from a workflow perspective that we build that in into our discussion about adoption. And as, as a barrier to adoption, how could that be overcome? I think it's interesting you say the security piece because I've heard so many people use that as the excuse and I think it's only an excuse because we know yeah. that we can solve that. But you know, yeah. I think I think we're at the point where now they can't use it as an excuse anymore. And I guess maybe that's the, the next question is what is really going to move the needle? I mean, we've brought up a lot of interesting points. Is it going to be consumers pushing it? Is it going to be a re reimbursement model change? Is it going to be, uh, you know, the ACOs and value-based reimbursement? You know, what's really going to make it, or, you know, is it going to be freed up from regulatory hurdles that, you know, now we're, we're done with meaningful use and we can actually work on something other than EHR? Uh, you know, or is it going to be all these things? What, all, what all of the above. <laughs> Plus a risk done. mitigation strategy, too, for on, the, on the side of people are going to use texting, whether or not a secure texting is available. So. Yeah, I, I saw one doctor. You know, I was in advising a, a text message company at the time, and so I asked him about secure text and why he didn't use it. He's like, oh, I use text all the time. And I was like, oh, really? It, you just do it insecurely? He said, yeah, I just make sure there's no PHI in it. And I'm like, oh, interesting. And you know, he was an orthopedic, uh, uh, I think a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And I was like, well, what about the picture? He said, oh, yeah, we'll do pictures too. We take pictures of the x-ray and send it. I'm like, well, that's kind of PHI. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's some questions there, right? But, uh, but, oh, yeah. but the OCR has just issued a final rule clarification that this is okay as long as a patient accepts responsibility for the lack of secure communication, right? So, like, they've just clarified that this is acceptable. I think there, there's a couple a couple elements that come up when it is above it is everything above that you just mentioned, but there's a couple couple things that come up there too. One is, you know, the structure of the current uh, primary care clinic is not set up to to necessarily be the the um, to fit a texting model or communications model like this as well. So other services are stepping in to take that place. And it, I think culturally, if the caregivers feel like that these tools are connecting them to their patients, they become massive advocates for these tools. If they feel like these tools are disassociating them or disconnecting them from their patients or creating a barrier to care, 
they're going to do, uh, they can stop a lot of innovation um, from, from happening. So I, I think the way, you know, we're positioning the tools culturally to make sure that, that, it, that they're seen as connecting us deeper to our, the, you know, the, to providing and enhancing care is really important. Mm -hmm. And the workflow of how it works, you know, uh, um, you don't want a thousand texts coming into a, a caregiver as an individual. There's, there's ways and systems and, and uh, triage capabilities for services to really help you with that as well and still give that great instant response you expect when you text. When you text, you expect a response, you know? A texting service that comes back to you two days later is not a texting service. Yeah, and I would also, yeah, just, to also to just to add to that, um, the way that we've seen people using it, uh, and I've seen, you know, over the last few years that we've been working on this, I've seen a number of different case, uh, or different, different works, work, work flows and different um, use cases, but, but I think generally what you find generally, is you'll run into the situation where providers will say, uh, no, this feels really impersonal, texting. Oh, that's not a good feeling. Um, and then they learn that once the patients start using it, that it's actually totally changed the patient experience in a positive way. Um, and so they've kind of been, they need to be educated uh, about just the simplicity and what patients go through um, on a regular basis in healthcare and how difficult it is to have a conversation. Um, you know, in particular, I'm thinking of, uh, a cancer hospital that used OMD and they did a study uh, at the end and, and talked to all the patients using OMD and 97% of them said, I'd rather use OMD than pick up the phone to call you or using your patient portal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those are really valuable metrics to be able to judge whether this is working or not. Uh, but it, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, it, it takes time for people to really understand of, of texting. And then one other thing I'll, I'll add before I stop talking is, uh, it's interesting to see how the texting dynamic works for the patient. So, great example, I have a question for, for my doctor, um, and I send it, well, via OMD anyway, with our functionality, I send it and it goes to my care team. Um, even if my care team responds in a reasonable amount of time with a, hey, I'm you know, gonna grab the doctor and I'm gonna ask him this question, um, that makes me feel like I'm being taken care of as a patient, as opposed to, something that literally happened to me yesterday where I uh, had to call the office, I left them a voicemail, they called me back two days later um, to let me know that they called in my, my uh, prescription renewal. I didn't know whether it was being worked on, I didn't know if I could check it off my box of things to do or my list of things to do. So it really changes the dynamic, but patients really feel like even if I get this, uh, you know, hey, I'm working on it uh, message, that's a huge improvement over what they're getting today. That's great, and I, I think it's great uh, if you guys are watching the chat room also, and, uh, or James, I guess, about Bannigan on Twitter. He's, he's listening. You know, he's a perfect example of what Nathan talked about. Once they adopt it, I guess Ethan hit on this as well. Once they adopt it and learn it, then they love it, right? Like then they're, right. then they're advocates for it. But you know, there is that hurdle that you know they have to get over to experience it and realize. Oh, if I start texting, my patients won't annoy me, uh, you know, all the time whenever they want, and I won't, I won't have to give all these free services. But it will actually make me more efficient than if I didn't use it, because I'm replacing that phone call back and playing phone tag, and it's replacing, you know, all these inefficiencies that we currently uh, have. So let's switch gears to some of the benefits you've seen. You know, even anecdotal experiences you've heard from your uh, clients, or or even big picture. You know, what are the cost savings, efficiency wise, or security wise? Or, you know, what are the benefits that people should look to to say, yeah, you know what, I have made a mistake in not adopting these sooner, and I should do so now. Just or Nathan, either way. Go ahead, Nate. <laughs> I was going to say that um, I think the, the proactive benefits are, are what we're seeing. And people, uh, if, if they're engaging in a communication platform, what, and I know we're talking a lot about text today and there's other, there's other things to talk about, but uh, proactively we see people engaging in their care. Uh, you know, they're actually on a chronic disease management standpoint, the way our, our service is, is running, you know, they're working with, uh, nurses to actually proact who are reaching out to them proactively through text and and uh, and coaching them through text even there's whole therapies you can deploy through text um, and allowing those folks to get really um, 
uh, engaged in managing their disease in a, in a much a lower level ask on the brick and mortar system. So we've seen a very early reduction in the control of hypertension. We've seen in a, a study that we're currently um, uh, wrapping up a 50% reduction in, in bringing people from poorly controlled to controlled hypertension. And that's with a 95% satisfaction rate with the service that they're receiving. Um, and it's all being pushed through these new communication channels. So when you do call on the brick and mortar service, which is the high cost call, it's, it's uh, only when it's really needed for those moments of, of really intervening with the patient um, when they need that care and not for the wellness check or the monitoring check or um, the second thing I'll just say real quick there is the amount of data that you can gather through these kind of communication tools that the care teams and the doctors can be presented with actionable trended information that allows them to be far more efficient uh, as well. So we've seen savings and reduction in brick and mortar services, we've seen savings in controlling chronic disease and we've seen savings in hitting quality metrics around satisfaction um, just with use of these new tools. Great. Anything to add, Well, I, I, well I, I don't have a specific story. I have a question, really, for, for Ethan and for Nate and around the success stories. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about how these, these types of communications technologies could be deployed for care coordination for complex patients, right? So, Nate, you talked about, you know, the... Um, hypertension and the in improvement in satisfaction and, and uh, therapy deployment for, for hypertension and, and I'd like to understand a little bit about kind of a use case for complex patients for care coordination because I would think that that'd be another really huge opportunity for these types of communications. So, and I don't want to turn it into like an ad for Imagine Care, so I'll be very careful there, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think keeping it general that when we are able to deploy these tools into the hands of chronic disease patients, and our focus is on hypertension, CHF, diabetes, and COPD, and start to provide proactive sensing. So sometimes you have sensors that are deployed as well where we're actually getting proactive vitals. Um, the opening up that communication channel that's 24-7 is essentially immediately closing the chronic care gap. You have uh, chronic disease patients, once they understand that the service is there for them 24-7 and they can ask that service anything 24-7, engage. And then it's our job, obviously, to keep them engaged. So um, use cases for us range from folks who, um, I'll give you two ends of the spectrum that we just saw use cases for recently. One was a woman who's been on uh, diagnosed with hypertension for eight years, and she enrolled in Imagine Care and started engaging with us and we were obviously doing some monitoring as well and her doctor realized she only had high, she had white coat diagnosis, she was only really hypertensive because of uh, going into the office and getting her wellness check in between, you know, through our coaching and awareness she's, she's not actually even hypertensive. So the other end of the spectrum where we had a woman who was diagnosed um, and put on new meds for hypertension and actually had falling blood pressure and through text triage we were able to actually get her realized that she was asymptomatic, hypotensive, and needed to have direct contact with her um, a clinician for a med adjustment. And both of those are text-driven, new channel communication-driven interactions uh, mm -hmm. where the, we're either proactively able to push out questions via text, and that's the other part I think we should talk about, or receive back those uh, questions from folks because they're not feeling well um, and triage those things immediately. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the interactive piece of reaching out as opposed to waiting. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tool. It's a tool to actually reach out and do triage, rolling health risk assessments. Um, I think a lot of us have probably been involved in use cases of this before it was kind of deployed into product, where uh, text has been used very, very well for diabetes management, health risk assessment in rural populations as well, where. Uh, you know, making a care coordination much easier. So that proactive element of it, I think, is really important. Um, automation plays into a lot of these solutions as well, and I know, uh, and you know, Ethan could probably talk to that as well. Where there's some automated uses where you can optimize your responses to folks based on the com customer information you have on them, um, and give them some automated nudges and kudos and alerts as well uh, before you kick into the human uh, interventions. And there's a lot of sophisticated work that's being done uh, by companies in the space in that area as well, is how to use the best of the, um, um, the automated, optimized, uh, automated text as well as then intervening with human intervention. Yeah, I think it's yeah, interesting. Think it's interesting. You almost said almost that, said that voice communication to you and the sensor communication was not communication. And I think we often go, we often go okay, okay, if I give them a device and it tells me how they're doing, their heart rate, their blood pressure, their whatever, right? right? That's a form of, a form of 
right? I mean, robot is uh, human, right? Or not a robot if it's a robot system, and then it's analyzed, analyzed and decide who do you need to you know, do an intervention. But I think that communication is just as powerful, and it can lead to that proactive outreach. You know, how are you doing? Because your, you know, your device is telling me you're not doing so great. <laughs> I think kind of like philosophically big picture for communication, you know, you wouldn't communicate in any other industry with, um, or you don't communicate at the level we try to communicate in healthcare with as little as we know about you. We get a lot of vital information. EHR has, a, depending on your doctor and your care team, has a lot of information about your physical them. We do a very poor job about social determinants and customer preferences. I think an important part to talk about with text is that we also capture, and I think people should capture preferences around text and then honor those. So can you imagine a healthcare system where you said, I want you to call me at this time, and they actually called you or texted you at that time? It would be like a huge win in healthcare, but in any other industry, we would just expect it to happen other than maybe the cable industry. Um, and so, and so I, I think the customer preference and the social determinants and understanding how to communicate to people through these channels can be much more sophisticated than just um, you know, text triage or text, um, you know, reminders, I guess, as well. Excellent. Excellent. Ethan, you want to add a conversation? Uh, you know, I, I'm in agreement with everything Nate said. Uh, the only thing I would want to add is um, to take it a step further and think about uh, when you do have this human interaction that's happening and you, you have this dialogue, um, it's, it's really the only time that you've ever been able, or that we have, as healthcare uh, has, have ever been able to capture um, in data what this communication looks like, right? And then you start thinking about artificial intelligence and what you could potentially do to identify high-risk patients based on this captured data that we have in dialogue format. Um, the, I think the future of text-based communication is pretty bright in that respect because we've never had this type of, uh, of, of data to, to work with before. Yeah, the, la the, the ability to have uh, the data for just natural language processing uh, capabilities of reviewing these is huge, and even in early stages where, you know, um, we along with a lot of other companies are doing that, where, uh, you know, it's hard to process encounter notes, um, unstructured data like an encounter note, but when you have these kind of communications captured the way you have, processing those quickly with machine learning allows you to really optimize communications in the near term. You also start to optimize care pathways, um, which is a really cool part if you're into the evidence side of what we're doing. So I agree with what Ethan's saying. There's a whole other push there, too. Yeah. Yep. Jess, were you uh, adding something in? No, I, yeah, well, I just said, at, and at such volume, I think that, that there's a volume of data that we haven't seen before. And I think, um, going back to some early comments, one thing that came to mind that I'm, I can appreciate in both um, the Imagine Care solution and the OMD solutions um, from a broader perspective is really the co-development with um, the end users, both the staff and the patients. And I know that the, with any solutions architecture, if you're going to make it usable um, and um, dovetail into people's lives in the way that we want it to and the, the way that we envision it will, um, it really needs to have that value proposition of um, iterative design and development with, with behavioral aspects woven in and, and, and all of that um, as a major component of the uh, feature development and the iterative uh, design of it. So I think that's an important piece that was missing I just wanted to add. Right. Well, we said we'd get back to that, so that's perfect. Uh, and I think Nate brought it up first, right, that there's a difference between developing for the provider versus developing for the patient and kind of consumer of the health. And I think that's been missing in a lot of the solutions, right? Uh, we've just tried to optimize the workflow of the provider and not necessarily the patient. And I think the new reimbursement models are forcing us to have to spend time really understanding the patient and working with them. You know, I mean, and it, I think at the I think like of every, every solution that I see out, I see out is a good communication platform. You know, you need good people to reach out to, to why you should reach out to them, but then you need a way to reach out to them and connect with them and influence their behavior. And I, I think that's the next major step that we need to accomplish. Yeah, so. I think, and, and they're obviously all tied together. You know, I think, I, I feel like there's enough people advocating on the, um, 
existing brick and mortar space though that you know standing up and saying let's be consumer centric is an okay thing to do uh, because the balance will naturally occur and, and so I think the difference is that you know if I try to design a solution that's not uh, patient portal driven but I understand that if I'm the doctor I want to see that information in the workflow that I'm in today I don't want to have to leave the workflow that I'm, I'm mandated to be in to log into another workflow to see that. None of us want to do that. I mean, we don't want to do that when we're checking our email and our calendars. So to ask doctors and, and nurses to do that as well, I think we have to obviously keep an eye to that. But if the consumer doesn't want to use the tool, it doesn't really matter if it's efficient for the providers and the, and the nurses or not because you won't have the engagement. So without that being done first and that being the first box to check, it won't matter how efficient it is for um, or the care team if you don't have patients that want to use it. Interesting. What's your take on that, Ethan, with uh, Secure Text? Uh, I mean, most EHRs aren't mobile. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's been interesting to see the evolution. It'll be interesting to see if it evolves and integrates with the EHR deeply. But what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm uh, expecting that if I say if I really spoke my mind right now, I'd get some emails from some of my vendor friends saying, "Hey, don't trash uh, the patient portal. It really works." Um, but I think when I think about things from a consumer centric perspective. It's all about friction. All about friction. Right? Yes. You look at, you look at Instagram and you look at uh, Uber and you look at Grubhub and you look at the apps that are working in the consumer world. What makes them make some stickiness? They're frictionless and they provide a simple, uh, a simple value proposition that this works for them. And it's, most of them are single use. Um, and so that makes it even easier. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but like it's really eliminating the friction. Uh, is the only way to get patients using this. And when you think about the patient portal, and if you've ever used a patient portal, the sign up process has a ton of friction. Using it, getting in there, and learning what the portal is all about, different value propositions in the portal, a lot of friction there, and you lose people really quickly. And that's, uh, that's kind of been our hypothesis um, from the beginning has been if you eliminate the friction, um, then we can, and, and the value proposition is clear. Then you can bring patients on board. That's what this whole thing will. Well, patients using it. Patients don't use it. And it's perfect. It's ripe for innovation because you have these massive EHR companies that, when they're now trying to do this, have this huge infrastructure and kind of uh, weight that they have to carry to try to figure out these solutions. Where a smaller, more nimble, more uh, customer-focused company can really come in and swipe up. Uh, consumers into a solution that, is, as Ethan described, is more frictionless. So I think it's also a really exciting time to have that innovative thinking injected into healthcare um, to disrupt. Because it's going to be really hard for the Epics and the uh, Cerners and the Oscripts of the world to kind of top down create tools that are described that, that meet kind of the qualifications Ethan just described. Yeah. Well, and that goes back. Well, that goes back. To we said we'd come back. We'd come back. How do you manage? you know, this whole kind of proliferation of communication tools, right? I can go my portal, I can go to my secure text I can go to solution health care, you know, solution through my through blah, 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 right? I mean, we're just layering, layering communication, which one provides an experience for the patient, six different ways to talk to you. But also, you know, at some point, the IT department says, I can't, I can't support 10 different communication systems because you say, hey, I didn't get the message. And I say, well, on which system? You know, and did you do it through the EHR interface or did you do it through our secure text interface? Or did, you know, and maybe those are integrated. You know, so what's the right strategy to approach communication going forward that you avoid kind of the proliferation of, of communication systems? Um, I, you know, I think I'm the wrong person to answer that question because in my mind, uh, as long as I'm providing providers value and I'm providing patients value, the enterprise can figure it out. I mean, I, and I get that there's a bigger issue around that, but I think for me, it's like my goal is uh, let's improve the patient experience by really simplifying this process and making communication better, and, and the industry will ad adapt to it. Uh, that's all I... All I can hope for, and that maybe you know, maybe in some cases the EMR is the central hub and repository for absolutely everything that happens. All workflows start there and end there. And if that's if that continues to be the case, then uh, then this will fit in nicely. But, uh, I, 
Yeah, and probably Jess and me know more about how they plan on uh, stacking up this technology and making it work in the workflows. I, I mean, you don't want to solve interoperability on this call? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I, if we could do, like, another hour after this, we could talk. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wrote an entire I, series uh, on that. I was thinking about this, uh, you know, as comments were coming in and, you know, the the signature of mediocrity being all things inconsistent, you know. Uh, I, think, I think it will take uh, a regulatory mandate to at least create guardrails so that things can converge around a set of solutions or a set of um, requirements for solutions that will will pare down and, op you know, and optimize and also incent um, further innovation in this space. And, I, and it reminds me of a recent visit to um, the ONC a couple of weeks ago where they are really tackling this right now and putting together a group of folks to, to think about medless interoperability and you know, um, how, that might, how that might look and what a prototype minimum viable product might look like or a set of guardrails. Um, with a, with a group of uh, stakeholders, so I think I think that is in the future because I don't think we can continue to flood the market space with a whole bunch of different solutions. But I think so long as you know there's a, a meaningful um, incentive to continue to innovate, um, there there will be you know uh, solutions uh, and more uh, open more platform, platform, open platform uh, capability to be able to. Be able to and that kind of interoperability is going to happen. I mean, my, my vision has always been for secure text that, you know, that we're going to end up with three or four winners, and it's going to generally be regionally that they're going to be the powerhouse in that region, and then they'll come together and say, okay, let's talk to each other, and let's create some protocol that we can share between each other. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that's going to happen, but... The challenge to Ethan's thinking, though, I think, is that we saw this in the EHR world. People adopted this best-of-breed system, essentially. You know, in this case, we're talking best-of-breed communication system. In the EHR world, they were adopting a best-of-breed lab and a best-of-breed pharmacy and a best-of-breed clinical. You know, and and you know and what they realized, though, is that that you know at scale for a health system is brutal. And so they ended up doing away with it. And now there's this whole trend that says, oh. If it's not epic, we're not buying it, right? So, you know, they created that mentality that said, okay, I don't care if you're best of breed. I don't care if, uh, you know, Epic's lab system is awful. It's better than having to deal with two systems. And so we're going to go with one, you know, kind of that whole uh, principle of, you know, one neck to ring when there's a problem as well, right? So there's no none of this finger pointing uh, you know, not my problem uh, approach to systems. So I, I think that's the challenge, right, is eventually you'll get shut out of the market if you don't uh, create reasonable ways to uh, manage it uh, that, that is comfortable for them. And I guess in some ways it helps if you're a SaaS system. So, you know, anyway, that, that's kind of the counter argument, I guess. Yeah, I, uh, I have great responses to that, but it gives away the whole secret sauce for uh, the go-to-market strategy. So, yeah, um, I totally agree. Um, I was about to say the same thing. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you, though. Totally valid counterpoint. Um, and, you know, as we know, and, and John, you're ahead of your time, right? You've been thinking about secure texting for a very long time. You must be getting frustrated with how long it's taken for healthcare, healthcare like really, 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 really there's value. Yeah. Um, so we can't wait for it. We have to force it and uh, and then see what happens on the tail end, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Ethan. I think you know you got to meet the customer where they are right now and where they're going to be and where you see the trends going and and let the chips fall where they may. And the interoperability goes far beyond texting. Uh, these mm -hmm. platform integrations, you have to be. And I'm sure Ethan is maybe alluding to this too. I mean, you have to be thinking on the back end about how you're going to play in the world of interoperability, whether it's platform to platform or um, other other methodologies. And so, keeping your know, your eye on that, you have to be thinking that way. But at the same time, you got to keep your foot down, you know, keep the pedal down on meeting the customer where they are right now, because there's a lot of power there too for change. Yeah. I have a I have a question on interoperability, the subject of interoperability, and, and being able to take these communications to the next level and do cross-platform integration of the uh, the text messaging as well as the insights. The you know we've talked about social determinants of health and the other insights that, that we might gather. Um, have you guys thought about 
entering the fire movement and developing fire profiles to be able to integrate the insights that you're getting. I know OMD, you know, I, I know that that's this is not necessarily on the immediate roadmap, but is this something that you're thinking about, being able to leverage that fire movement so that you can develop the profiles to deliver these insights into cross-platform EMRs? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely uh, on the roadmap. I mean, it's it's something we can do already. I mean, really, the as we looked at building this out, we, we said, all right, well, we know we're going to have to have an integration layer that is flexible, that uh, I don't care who the vendor is on the other side. I can take this data, and I can parse it, and I can ship it off, and I can be, you know, and that's okay. Um, I can't trust that every vendor is going to, uh, in a timely way, be able to adhere to these, uh, these protocol, but mm -hmm. everyone's moving in the right direction, um, slowly but surely. You've got vendors like, vendors like who are just out ahead of, out ahead of it, um, making um, API access simple. You got, I mean, all the vendors are working on some, uh, some level of integration, and then some just way better than others. So we're, we're prepared for all of that stuff, and we know how important it is to fit into the workflow. What's kind of nice, and there, there aren't, these aren't technological problems to solve, as I think we all know, but in the current right. state, there's a lot of great vendors out there right now that are doing the work to connect you to legacy systems if you want to normalize messaging for APIs or JSON. And so there's, there's really no technical hindrance for interoperability, even with legacy systems. And then, of course, more forward-leaning interoperability is really exciting. Um, you know, once there's enough kind of uh, once there's enough adopters of it, and it really becomes a, a, a driver for integration, it'll be great. Um, but right now, I think if you look at the market, and you're trying to sell something. You have to be able to kind of play in. You have to have your feet in many canoes at the same time, um, just to be able to serve the market where everyone is right now. Hmm. So let that. Let, 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 let. We're up against the clock. We have a few minutes left. I thought, you know, to finish, let's talk about where healthcare communications headed. Maybe Ethan can speak to it, kind of from a secure tech standpoint. And, you know, the rest of us can kind of go beyond that. What other communications needed? I mean, is it a, a uh, API-driven future that's integrated into the HR? Or, you know, wh what's your your uh, perspectives on where is all this headed? Where you know, so that uh, the CIOs at hospitals that are listening or the doctors that are listening can kind of, you know, to use the Wayne Gretzky analogy, can skate to where the puck's going as opposed to where it is today. So, Ethan, you want to start off with secure text? Yeah, I mean, I guess just to reiterate my uh, my stance on all of this is um, it's going to go wherever the patient wants it to go, and and we're at a place where um, the technology can support uh, frictionless experience and communication, and if that's where the patient is, then uh, healthcare will adapt to that. And so I don't know ultimately what that ends up looking like and how that fits into the tech stack of any uh, any hospital enterprise. I just I just feel like we have an opportunity now where you have across demographics, um, you have universal acceptance of smart smartphones, you uh, you have people that understand apps, you have everyone that understands texting, and the store the uh, anecdotal uh, evidence of you know octogenarians using text messaging that's real. Uh, it might not be full you know f uh, full adoption across uh, eighty year olds everywhere, but it's happening. Um, and I think wherever the patient ends up being, um, the hospital, the hospitals and health systems and practices uh, will want to be there as well. So that's my my two cents on it. Excellent, Jess, you want to add uh, any the future? Sure, I I think um, all this is going to have uh, other very exciting consequences. I think if we do this right, we'll start to see net new practice delivery. We'll see the traditional practice models changing. And then uh, further downstream, which will affect um, the, the shortages and the thing and the pressures that we see um, with regard to workforce retention, um, provider retention, just the ease and the, the sheer mass of data and being able to bring health intelligence from a population um, architecture perspective for these solutions is really going to empower um, some skip generation efficiencies and uh, changes to the practice that I think. And then uh, beyond that, I see a, a definite impact to um, the curriculum and the teaching and training programs around uh, the delivery of, of medical care and what that, that will be further on, but I think that will start to happen and it will be the expectation of these new people coming through um, medical school and um, 
allied health programs and 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 all of our uh, workforce colleagues to be uh, that the, that these tools will be at their fingertips and that will also drive um, the competitive marketplace for these as well. Great, Mandy. Any kind of thoughts? Where is healthcare communication going, or what does it need to do? Uh, I, I don't have anything substantially new to add to what Jess and Ethan just said. I, I completely agree. I think that the future is going to be driven by um, driven by the patients and the healthcare consumers, and I, I think that we are very quickly reaching a tipping point by which they must be heard, and their preferences must become part of the, not only the conversation but the commercial offerings that are available in this space. Nice. And Nate? I disagree with I disagree with all of this. I think you were charged the answer. <laughs> um, I just, just glad, and I know we're over time, but I would say that I agree, the consumer is definitely going to solve the interoperability question as far as I read the market as well. The consumer is going to be what pushes the interoperability thing to the forefront and solves it. And it's going to be more customer relationship management solutions. Um, you know, for if you're in other industries and have applied kind of CRM before, it's going to be those kind of solutions, not EHR solutions, that will uh, really keep driving these communications forward beyond what we've been talking about today and into actually proactive, analytic, forward-thinking um, care, you know, helping people before they even know they need help uh, is where communications is going to go. Excellent. And in honor of uh, McLaughlin, who just passed away this week, uh, I'll give this way he finishes. I'll say, well, the correct answer, it's going to be data-driven and integrated. Bob, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, so thanks so much to uh, all my guests uh, for joining me and those that watch live. Uh, we have Mandy Bishop, Chief Evangelist and Co-Founder of Aloha Health, Jessica Johnson, Director of Operations, Health, tra health Transformation at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Hitchcock, sorry. sorry. Ethan Bechtel, OMD. And Nathan Larson, Chief Experience Officer at Imagine Care. You can find more great videos like this at healthcarescene.com, and we also post them to ehrvideos.com, where we post all the various interviews we do on YouTube. And uh, we'll be back again. I know we have two of them coming up one about social determinants of health, and the other one about APIs in healthcare. So watch for those to be announced on the Healthcare Scene uh, Network of Blogs. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.